Team of Design Basics. So obviously we have the obligatory agenda. Uh, tell us what we're going to cover today. We'll really give you a, a high level review of Hadoop and HBase. Then we'll start giving uh, a jump into schema design. Uh, about me, I really hate doing this, but I have to. Um, I've been working with Hadoop since 2009. Started here at Navtech and Nokia. Uh, working on LCMS project with uh, Jim Scott. It's all his fault. Uh, for real. I really hate doing these type of things, but long story short is, you know, I, I want to try to be humorous, you know, like long walk with short peers. Um, I'm starting a new user group called uh, Big Data Anonymous, and it's for people who have been so frustrated, tore their hair out, and gone insane from working with big data. For a lot of you newbies, I give you six months, then you're going to be joining that group. And it really is a, a true group. He charges for that group. No, I, I wish I did. That's for the alcohol. There we have alcohol. Um, before we start getting a quick review of the Duke, um, just one thing, this uh, presentation was based on some work that I did uh, for Think Big Analytics and Matt Barr in their HBase course. It's a two-day course. The schema design is about two, three hour of that, and I'm compressing it down to 45 minutes. So it may go really fast this is the first time I'm presenting it. So if there's questions, raise your hand and we'll stop. And if we get stuck, we'll just save it to the end. All right, so I want to do a quick review of Hadoop. Uh, basically, <coughs> Big data is coming everywhere. Uh, as I said earlier today, uh, we have 1,300 members in Chubb, which is a good example, and that's just Chicago. So that means there are a lot of companies that are normally not IT companies in our city of Silicon Valley. So Hadoop is definitely starting to hit mainstream. Uh, components of MapReduce. So that we look at MapReduce as a distributed programming model. So you take your data, you take your work, and you can spread it up, parallelize it, at the end, bring it back together. So you have a map phase reduce phase. Uh, Hadoop overall is a distributed computing framework, which partially is MapReduce, partially is HDFS, and a few other pieces. Uh, the thing I want to point out here that's kind of important is that HDFS uh, is a write once, read many file system. It sits on top of your Linux file system. It also sits on top of Microsoft now. So it's a warm uh, file system. And because of that, implementing create, update, deletes, or CRUD, those type of activities are a challenge. So we're going to see in HBase you don't really have CRUD. And again, we focus on the Hadoop ecosystem. When you, buy, when you buy or download Hadoop from Apache or Cloudera or Hortonworks or MapR, you're basically getting a distributed file system, MapReduce framework, Hive, which is a SQL-like language against flat files, Pig, which is a procedural language that just gets translated also into a MapReduce like Hive. And then HBase, which is a NoSQL, uh, non sequential data store, or actually non SQL data store. And we're going to focus on HBase. So, really, what is HBase? We already said it's a NoSQL database. <coughs> it's column oriented, uh, at least down at the storage layer, so we don't really have to worry about that just yet. It's a highly distributed database, it grows, uh, it's very scalable in terms of cluster. And if you want to sum it up in one line, think of it, how many Java developers are here? All right, so if I say non-relational persistent data store, I'm not scaring anyone. It's basically a place to store objects. But then we go into what's not HBase. So we start off saying HBase is not, obviously a relational database. It does not have transactional support. It's not built upon a traditional file system. Again, as we said, HDFS is a worm. It's write once, read many. It's not a standalone system, although technically you can uh, run it as a standalone system. Usually it comes as part of the Hadoop framework, so it's always built on top of HDFS. It's also not the only NoSQL game in town. So when you hear an HBase, you'll hear Accumula, which is kind of its uh, DOD brethren. Uh, both came out of the, the big table paper from uh, Google. Uh, the DOD created Accumula, which they Accumula, which they've released as open source now as part of Apache and HBase was started off as a public uh, source. So we started looking at comparisons. Uh, everyone, everyone's, has everyone worked with H, uh, relational databases? So we look at the terms, that are familiar with them. ACID, um, you've got your, you know, get sharding, partitioning, SQL, trigger store procedures. If we take a look, we have actually similar 
features uh, on the HBase side. With the exception of ACID, we do have distributed regions across the data, across the cluster. Rather than having a SQL language, a query language, we actually have a key lookup, uh, key range stamps. It's uh, programmatically either Java, Pig, uh, Ruby, or JRuby, I should say. Uh, there is a project coming in from salesforce.com which gives you a SQL interface on top of it. But that's really not part of the core HBase. You do have indexes, B-tree, R-tree, but in HBase you have no indexes. Not as part of the base, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, your relational database is highly normalized. You will see a lot of times third normal form, and very rarely will you then violate that to a second normal form just for performance. And in HBase, that is denormalized. You don't want to think outside of the individual table. Uh, relational databases, you have primitive data types. You have string, you have character strings, you have ints, floats, decimals, all sorts of types. With HBase, everything's byte array. Everything's a blob or a blob. In our in relational database, another key feature is in place updates. Within HBase, because you don't have a read write file system, you still have a write once read many, you have cell versioning. So when you write to a column, it's going to be timestamps to be cell inside a column. And we'll get into that and talk a little bit more. So again, um, everybody here, how many people have really got a strong uh, relational database background? Great. OK, a lot of you. So MySQL, uh, Oracle, Sybase, DB2, Informix. All right. What about using uh, non-relational databases uh, from like PIC? I'm sure my age here, Revelation. Dick Pick's been dead for a while. Uh, YouTube, Universe 2, um, Cobalt. OK, a few of you. So we start looking at things there, and then not everything's relational. We start looking at PIC. Uh, it's a hierarchical database structure. Cobol is flat file, again, uh, can be considered hierarchical as well, depending how you use it. So there's more than one way to look at things. Let's talk about why HBase for a second. Uh, primarily because HBase does handle um, both structured and unstructured data. Relational databases do not. They only handle structured data. And in terms of unstructured, you'll hear me sometimes call it semi-structured. Because in truth, all data has structure to it. The other thing in HBase handles enormous volumes of data. Uh, you're looking at being able to handle, um, well, hundreds of terabytes up to a petabyte of data. Uh, it's very cost effective in terms of scalability. Uh, most people, uh, when they start to create Hadoop clusters, they're using commodity servers. So if we want to expand the database, all you have to do is put it in a new server, and you pay your licensing costs for whether you're using MapR or Cloud Era or whoever your vendor of choice is. It's near linear in scalability. And by this, I mean if, in HBase, you have the ability to use get to, get to fetch a row out of HBase. So when I say get row and here's the row, here's the row key, it comes out, let's say it's five milliseconds. And again, the time it takes to pull the data out is going to be very, is going to vary based on your hardware, your equipment, 10 gigi. Uh, she's laughing at me. Or it's going to be looking at in terms of um, the size of the row coming out. So there are a lot of systems that are like sub, or multiple, like one or two milliseconds. Most are five milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. The point here is that if I have a system that's pulling data out in five to 10 milliseconds per query, when I go and scale it out, that same get, even if I have 10 terabytes to 100 terabytes, it's gonna take five to 10 milliseconds. It's gonna scale linearly as I, as I grow my data. The other thing too about HBase and why I really love it, it's free. It comes as part of the, it comes part of the Hadoop ecosystem. So when you go into uh, MapR, Map5, Cloudera, um, you know, CDH4, you start getting into Hortonworks and their release, IBM and their release, HBase is there. It's free, you're already paying for it, might as well use it. It doesn't make sense to use a different database. So that's kind of a quick background. Any questions that I cover? Does people have a good understanding I mean, of what HBase does and doesn't do? <coughs> So I want to take a look at schemas. So remember we just talked about HBase is not a relational database. There is no SQL syntax. Joins are very expensive because what you have to do is you're writing, you're most predominantly writing your own Java code. So we try to join tables in HBase or in Hive or any or any of the languages that MapReduce. It's a very, very expensive task. So you don't see joins. So your tables tend to your tables tend to be your record. And your 
your, your unit work. Um, the other thing about a face is that we can store complex data types. And we'll see this inside a single column. So you have an extra dimension to your data. It's not just uh, set data types and that's it. It's not an X and Y. You have X, Y, and L, and Z. Uh, we have a thing called column families. We'll get into that. And that's a factor part of your design. Um, and we'll, go, we'll cover that. Column families are unique to HBase. They're not part, uh, there's really not a good translation to relational model. And one thing I really have to stress is that the schema design is incredibly difficult. Uh, a bad schema will kill you. A good schema, and you're laughing at this because you've lived through that. Uh, Jim and I worked on a project, and schema design pretty much killed the forms of the project. And if we had a chance to do it again, we would redesign it completely different. Uh, but schema design is, is something that if you do it right, will save you. If you don't do it right, it's going to kill your project in terms of performance. So we talked about HBase components. I'm going to do a conceptual. Uh, I don't have time to get into the physical structure of HBase. Uh, if you would like to learn more, uh, definitely there's Large George's book, which covers everything. It's the definitive guide for HBase. Uh, it's from O'Reilly Associates. I think he's on a second edition now, but definitely it's a book to, to read and to own. But we look at here and we see conceptually we have the table. It's our highest level. Breaks down into column families within the table. Then inside the column families, you have columns. And then the columns have cells or versioning. So at the, at, at the table creation, it's important to point out that only tables and column families are defined. Uh, the number of cell versions, which is a table-wide uh, parameter, it also gets set at table creation or altered at that. Columns come and go as you need them. So I want to kind of give you a practical example in terms of schema design <coughs> stuff. So the one thing that I thought everybody would be familiar with is an order entry system. How many people work in retail? I know we got some guys from Sears here. How many people in retail? Okay, or WW Granger or something. So well, we've all bought stuff. So we all have the back end order system. So we place an order, the order is generated, the order after the order is generated, you get the pick slips. After the pick slips, you go out and pull everything, you get shipping. So when things ship, they get a shipping order or shipping slip. And when you're all done, you can send an invoice. We're not necessarily in that order, but so we have four different things that happen off of a uh, a single uh, system. So when we're looking at an order entry system, we have four different types of work that gets done. If we're going to focus just on the invoice, then you can take a look here at um, Acne Supply. Uh, we have the master detail information. We have, again, the line items. We have the price. We have taxes, breakdown, and everything else. This would be a sample schema. It's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough for the example. And we can see in the relationships that we have one to many of a lot of items. We can see they're all broken down into separate tables. So when we're to do a query about that order, I have to do a couple selects and joins. I can't just say, fetch me this order. I have to grab everything. And if we take a look, obviously, you have the master detail. The detail, the line item, your, uh, your products, information, quantity, all that information, that's going to be in a, a multiple, a one-to-many relationship back to the, the header information. So we'll see a, if you're familiar with Informix and 4GL, it's a, it's you have a cursor and you have a for each. So for every, detail, for every master, we then go through and find all the detail lines that match it, and we then go through and iterate through that process. So to get the data back, it's a two-step process. Or what we could do is join the two tables and have duplication of information. So that all the master information gets duplicated for every line item. So both of the only two, those are the only two ways of getting data out. So looking back at that, everything's highly normalized. I'm actually going to point to this one. Um, so everything's highly normalized. There are a lot of joints you have to record, and you have to do a for each loop to get the master detail relationship worked out. But now we look at age base. Um, <clears throat> Blah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to slow down for a second. Because we have a defined schema um, that all you have is a table name and column, uh, column family. So your, your schema is very, very simple. But we're gonna, and the columns aren't defined when we first create that schema. 
But for our sake, we're going to actually have columns of data coming in because we know what they're going to be, and we're going to store them there. Uh, everything's stored in key value pairs so that when we have a row, we have our key, and our value is going to be all columns for that, for that row. So think in terms of a record. So we have an identifier that's unique, and we have all the data that sits out there. Um, everything is stored as Java byte arrays, and each table has to be considered standalone. Because again, if, if you try to join, your joins are going to be very, very expensive. So if I want to pick up a record, I want to pull everything all at once. It's going to be faster that way. It's going to be more efficient that way. So if we take a look at the model that we had a relational model, you know, then we go, we're going to put it into uh, HBase. You don't have entities. You only have a single entity. So all of a sudden, your entity relation modeling just goes away. Because when you create your HBase table, it's just going to be a block. We'll see that in a second. <coughs> um, your record should be cons consistently in a single row. So it, records really shouldn't be spanning column families. They shouldn't be spanning uh, anything but everything you need, you grab it once. That gets to be very wide, and that can be a problem, or it can be a very tall row. So it is something that we have to look at. Uh, and then, again, we only have time for one example here. Uh, so what we also want to do is we want to define our record based on the data we know. So for example, with a relational database type model for a, uh, an invoice, we know all the fields. It's going to be fairly static. So we can create our model based on that. So we go back to our invoice. And these are all the information we had. The company, company address, customer name, ship to address, dates. We had the line items. We had the subtotal, taxes, and total. But again, this is a very, very basic example. You can see we're going to put them all to a single table. And if we take a look here, um, really a company address. That's really an encapsulation, because you're going to have a street, you're going to have city zip, uh, you're going to have a suite number, potentially. So what we want to show you is that as we have this data, we can store all that data as a single row, whether it be a, a single string with height limiters, or we can go into a more complex uh, structure, such as app row. And again, this is why I pointed to this is our structure. As you can see, if I'm using an entity relational tool, where are my relationships? They don't exist. So this is one of the things that I think the hardest things that people who are using relational tools are used to it, get rid of them. They just don't work. Um, Ian Varley did a talk a couple years ago at HBaseCon where he talked about doing a, using entity relational modeling tools to, to build tables. And the hardest part I have with that is that it doesn't make sense to do that. You're shifting a paradigm. You don't have relationships. You have more of a hierarchical system. So. Basically, when we look at our invoice, it's just a list of our fields. And again, in some of these sec sections, like we start looking at the company address, uh, and telephone numbers, uh, customer, and the ship to address, billing addresses. We actually are, are encapsulating data here, at least at this level. But that's OK. So when we make our first pass, this is what we want to do. And if we have an encapsulation of data, we can deal with it in a couple ways. And we'll see, we'll see in, in how to do that in the future in the next couple of slides. And of course, this is just one example of how to do it. There are other examples out there. Just as I said, you know, I have a disagreement with Iron Fanny Barley. He's going to probably say this is what I'm doing is a cop. So, as we also take a look here, is I want to take a look at our invoice ID as our key. And now, in a relational model, that's fine. But for us, is this really a good row key? I mean, this case just talks about one invoice. It's unique. But is it really good for us? I also want to point out that I have our complex structures here. So I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone with this slide. So they asked that question about row key. We want to take a look at this. I want to say first, yes, it's the fastest access. Uh, because it's a single record, I want to get it back. So that's the importance of the uniqueness. If I want to do a scan to get information back, it's expensive. Full table scans are even more so. So in, in HBase, you have a get and you have a scan. And scan can be start row, stop row, or if you don't have them set, it's a full table scan. If you've got millions and millions and millions of rows, or billions of rows, that can be very expensive and time consuming on a cluster. So we want to go through this, and we do for, go through our checklist. We know the invoice ID is unique, and that gives us a good start. 
But let's also take a look and see how do we access our invoices? What are our use cases? And why is this not a good key? So if we start looking at this, obviously uniqueness, but you know we need to know um, what's our use case. So for example, if you're calling up on the phone and saying, hey, where's my order? It hasn't shipped yet. Do you actually always have to have your, do you have your order in front of you? You probably don't. But you're a customer and they can say, look, I'm Joe's, you know, Joe's auto body. I'm expecting this shipment to come in on parts. You're going to look and say, oh, Joe's auto body. Okay, hang on a second. I'll look up your orders. So again, they may know who you are, but they're not going to know the order ID, neither are you. So if all my orders are consistent by order ID only, I'm not going to be able to find that, that without taking a full table scan. So obviously there's not enough, the uniqueness isn't enough. But I know that that's how we're going to call it in. If I'm doing a pick slip, I don't really care about company code. I just care about here's an order I have to handle. So I'm going to have a list of those. So maybe again for a pick slip for the picking process, this isn't the best way. So the key here, the takeaway is that you've got to know your data. You've got to know how you're going to use the data, how you're going to work with the data. So unlike traditional relational modeling where I just have to know how the data relates, works out, and break it down. I have to know how, how I'm going to use as a use case. So your data modeler also has to be working with your developers, working with your business users to understand how to get the most out of the data. And that's a kind of a key takeaway, and that's probably the hardest thing to, to work with or to understand and to get over. So the other thing too is that you need to also look at your access patterns. You also need to make sure that the data is not coming in sort order. That is sequential numbers or, se or sequential names. Because as you load data sequentially, you run into hot spotting, and you also run into the problems with your table splits. So when we take a look at our example, how do we access orders, invoices, etc. We can go by specific invoice ID. Or we can go by customer number ID and then the order invoice. And that helps us with customer inquiries. So here, here's kind of a good thing to look at too. I've got two paths into the data, customer inquiries and also doing pick slips. Let me ask you this, which one of those is batch? Anyone? Which one do I do in a batch process? Pick slips. Right. So does it really matter if I'm really efficient because I'm doing it, I'm doing it in a nightly batch? Or I've got Joe, Joe's auto body on the phone who wants to know what's going on. <coughs> so basically, we want to say we want to make sure Joe's a happy customer. We don't want to have him waiting 15 minutes for you to get back to him. We want to be able to go to the screen, click on Joe's auto body. Here's the list of invoices. Quick to fetch. So we start looking at our our key, customer key. We start saying, okay, look, maybe the key should just be a customer ID, type, or character, uh, then the invoice ID. So that way, when we find Joe's auto body, we're going to find all of his ID, his customer his invoices by order, sort order, in the system. And that's a good way to find it. There's a drawback to that, and that is the fact that everything's, in, everything's stored in HBase in sort order. So the first order is first, second order is second. And if Joe's been a customer of yours for 15 years, he's not going to be worried about the first order. He's going to be worried about the last order. So there are certain tricks we can play with this, especially if order ID is unique. It's an ID, it's a number. We could take the epoch, which is <coughs> the largest number you can make of a, of a long, and subtract the order ID. That way, the new orders are always first. Big question here is what about timestamp? Do we need to put a timestamp as part of the order key? Anyone? Well, you can, but realistically, you don't need that. Um, each row also has a timestamp into that, and you can always use that as a way of identifying when the order is there. So, I want to show you the problem with sequential keys and table splits. And this is where we actually have a table. And we're adding data, starting off, going down, going down. So we have the first part of the table, we've added all these rows. We're getting ready to do a split. So in HBase, what happens is the region grows, it's split, split right in half. So the first half becomes region A, second half becomes region B. Now we split, we've got two separate regions. That's now we're going to add more data. But since all the data is sequential, it's always being added to the left or to the right. So as it added to the right, nothing's being added to the left. It's going to, go to always be added to the end or tail end of region B. That's going to cause hot spotting. Because that's always going to be the most active region when it comes to rights. At the same time, region A, 
once I've split that region in half, it's never going to grow because all the data is going to be added to one side. That's not a good thing. So as we go through this, and again, reiterating it or putting it in perspective, when you split, it splits in half, the old region just sits there, the new region gets built, added to, it goes to the point of where there still is a region size, max region size, it then splits. And then the next region grows, splits, grows, splits. You end up with half your region size filled, and you'll never add more rows after that. So you run into the problems, and that is where you're, you're not being the most efficient. At the same time, wherever that region server is, is handling that last region, that's going to be hot. That's going to be hot. You're going to have a lot of disk I/O going on, and that's going to be a slow point. And that's also going to be what they call hot spotting. So not only do you have hot spotting, but your regions aren't being efficient. You're only being half built. So let's take a look at an alternative so that doesn't happen. If we hash the row, and that is using SHA-1 or MD5, actually MD5 is better for most cases, uh, it's a little bit faster, we take our string, and there's always going to be a unique hash. So as long as that data never, as long as you want to get to that data, I type in the original string, it gets hashed, I now have that hash, which is random, or relatively random, I can look it up in the database. So I can fetch data very quickly. So if our use case is to fetch data quickly, then hashing makes a lot of sense. You don't get regional hotspotting, you get your data split across the entire cluster. Hashing works great if you know the entire row key. Um, there's talk about using partial key scans. This will never work with hashing, because you have to know the entire row, it has to be exact, otherwise you're in trouble. If you want to do partial key scans, the hashing's not right, it's going to kill you, because the only way to get the row is to actually go ahead and do a full table scan. Now, some people think that with MD5 or SHA-1 hash, and the reason I like both is because they, they're part of the Java pack security package. So whenever you have Java installed, you'll have both. You'll be guaranteed to have both of them there. Um, it, because the to start to do is to say, wait, I'm not sure I'm going to get a uniqueness. So I'm going to take that hash and I'm going to postpen or prepend that to the actual row key. So you end up with a very, very long row key, which is a, a good thing to have because it's a lot of wasted space. So what some people are doing is they're truncating and just taking the first four bytes of your hash and prepending that to your row key. So you end up getting the uniqueness, but then at the same time, you after the first four bytes, you have a user-readable key, which is your original key. <coughs> now, this again is different from assault. Say it really? So this is my pet peeve. Um, you've probably seen some of the stuff uh, from Semitex about using salts. Stay on a low sodium diet. Don't use salts. The difference between using a, a truncated hash and a salt <coughs> is that a salt is basically a round robin. So if I have, I want, if I want to get some, some distribu even distribution, I can choose a number between zero and 10. So I'll get zero through nine. So I have 10 buckets. That's my salt. And I'll round robin across that. So now my data gets put into one of 10 buckets. The problem is if I want to go and read that bucket, I have to now do 10 queries. So if I do the row key, I don't know where it is. So I now have to do 10 fetches to say, hey, does this row exist? If all 10 come back negative, then we know the row doesn't exist. If, they, if one of them comes back, I'll get that row. Salt, you get a parallel distributed system, yeah, it's not too bad. I gotta just do 10 calls. But that does 10 calls versus one call. And if you're doing a lot of lookups, it's not, it's not worth it. You're better off doing a uh, partial hash. It takes the first four bytes, gives you uniqueness, and the rest of the key's there. Then if I have to get that row back, I just take that row, hash it, get the first four bytes, and I can fetch it. So that's why using a, a hash is probably better than the part of the, the, the salting. Um, a lot of people still try to use it. I know one major customer who is using it, and I looked at it, I had to roll my eyes and bite my tongue. Uh, it's just really, really not efficient. If I want to do a scan, even a partial scans, if I do a start, I have to do start, start row, stop row, I have to look for that 10 times. So I have to do 10 different scans to find that data. So the benefit is, is my data is out there, it's dispersed, 
it's no hot spotting. But the downside is, is that every time I want to access that row, either if you're getting a unique row or getting a partial scan, I have to do more work. And, it's, it's more, and to me, that's, that's a waste. It's not, especially when there's alternatives that actually work better and more efficient. Any questions? Given what you just said, why would somebody advocate for using a salt? Um, my first page should be brain dead, but no. Um, because you haven't thought the problem through. Because they haven't looked at saying, you know, when they first looked at it, it said, oh, hash, that's a huge 128 bytes uh, for uh, an MD5 or a solid one hash. Um, and that just adds to the key. They have to think about taking it and truncating it. I, I really couldn't tell you why people <coughs> would recommend it. I've gone out and said, don't do it. And people look really like that from Mars. So is using the MD5 at that point any different from just randomizing four digits? Yeah, because that's, it's, it's, the hash is tied specifically oh, back. It's deterministic. Right, it's very okay, deterministic. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. yeah, so like you say, it's like, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Most people, when you start confronting about it, like, yeah, okay. But a lot of times, people think of this great idea, rush through and put it out there, and it sticks. So, it doesn't work. So anyways, getting back to key design, think about your data. Really, really think about the data you're, hosting, you're, you're, you're working with. Think about how you have to access this data. So, if you're the data modeler, don't don't work in a vacuum. Work with your developers. Work with your end users, so you understand how they're going to access the data, how it's going to be used throughout the application. That's kind of a critical thing. Avoid sequential keys. Now, and again, I say take what I say with a grain of salt, because there are times when you need sequential keys and you can put up with the hot spotting. For some system, it makes sense. So what I'm showing here today are, are, are general rules. Uh, no one to break them. Uh, also keep in mind, too, that um, the keys are in byte order. Uh, so there really isn't an index. Like, if you look at your primary key in a database, you have a, a backing store index there. In HBase, you don't have that. We basically have, and this gets into a little of the technical side of how they're organized, you basically have, for each region, you have a start row and a stop row. So when your database has multiple regions, I'm able to go through that list and say, here's my start and stop row, is it in there? No, go to the next region. So I can walk the list of regions, and that will tell me where I need to look for the data. So it's almost like an index, but it's not like the plus tree index or an R tree index. It's not like an official index. <coughs> the other thing too about key design is keep it simple. Did everybody hear the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid? Yeah. Best rule. Um, First thing I learned in college of engineering at Ohio State back in 19, well, we'll be back then, uh, is my old engineering graphics professor who was teaching us Fortran. He came out and said, keep it simple, stupid. And it's true. If you, do, if you try to simplify things, don't get overly complex, don't do over engineering, do an iterative process in your design, you're going to come out ahead. And again, for everything I've showed you, there are alternatives. So your mileage will, mar will vary. Now we get to the fun stuff, the, the column families. The good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, column families are unique to HBase. They have uh, some value benefits, but they can also be a pain in the neck to work with. So the good thing about column families, they allow me to partially segregate data uh, it's related using the same key. So when I go, the data is going to be organized together. So if I'm dealing with, let's say, we our invoices, and I'll show this in a second, um, I have my pick slips, I have my invoices, my order entry slips, and my uh, shipping slips. I have four different areas. So I put all, all sets of those data are unique. And our sets of data are unique. For example, you may be picking from different warehouses, so you have multiple pick slips generated. So they're all tied together. So I can all access them from the same system to be on the same region server. When a table splits, they all split. And that gets back into the bad, is that all the actions through the table families at the same time. So if I have a table, a column family, where I have some small set of data in one column family, but a huge amount of data in the other column family, and the larger column family splits, the small guy splits too. So whatever happens to one happens to all. And that can be dangerous because you start getting a lot more regions than you anticipated. And it, again, with multiple regions, there's overhead in terms of the region server, and you want to keep the number of regions down. 
Some people say less than 1,000, some people say less than 600, some people say less than that for regions and region server. I mean, Jim, have you heard of any? What have you been? You've been doing as long as I have. Just say no. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't use column families if you don't have to. Right? right? Sorry, just say Don't use column families if you don't have to. Right. It's when you have, when you have data that's combined together. And in this example that we're working with, it works. And Jim's absolutely right. If you don't eat them, you don't. You can also take data. A good test is your column families can be separate tables. Now the ugly. So this is, again, if you consider what happens to split the table, all the column families are usually split too. When you have smaller regions, it gets to be hard and more difficult. You start to see your system slow down. You start to see bad things happen. So even though there's no hard set number, um, we've had people who say, yeah, I've got 15,000 regions, and my, my performance is shit, or my French. Uh, you look at it and say, okay, why do you have so many regions? The other problem, too, is that you can split regions automatically. You can't push them back together. So it's a hard problem to fix and solve. So again, this is why thinking ahead of time, planning ahead of time is kind of important. You can put regions back together painfully. Yes, painfully. You can do it. There are systems doing it, but I don't know if you have to bring a re reboot, do a round run reboot of the table. You may have to get it back in. But it's a very painful process. I really don't recommend it. Now, that's the other thing, too, with HBase. There are a lot of people doing things that are quick fixes to get around certain things, but there's always a gotcha going to bite you on the backside. So, again, keep it simple, stupid is a good way to start, especially if you do have to do an HBase. Don't go off the deep end. Keep your design simple. Keep everything simple. But if we go back to the use case, and that's the custom orders. I have four things, the order entry, picks list, shipping, and what new invoices. They're all going to be roughly the same size. In terms of data, not much different. So when I split, they all can split is fine. They're all going to be keyed off the same thing, which is your uh, customer order ID. So that's another thing, so they can all use the same key. And the data is a little bit maybe just denormalized. So instead of trying to save space, where let's say the ship to address will be the same for the invoice, so you invoice them, as well as your shipping, as well as your pick, it's okay to duplicate it. As long as it's, you know, it doesn't really matter because there's not really a system of record here, and it all ties back to the order. Disk is cheap. Uh, you don't have to worry about being in the, the relational database where you have to have as much and tight as small as possible. Back in the days of the mainframe, even smaller, just was very expensive, storage was very expensive, you saw a lot more compression. So nowadays, disk is cheap, it's going to be replicated. Don't worry about saving space like this. So denormalization is definitely good. I have a question. Sure. Um, in your example, you had a column name when I think you're suggesting address and the line items, you know, being a column name. Right. Well, not column, columns. I'm oh, sorry? There are column names, yes. Yes, right. And so your second bullet talks about, I think, uh, having an identifier. So your address you have a shift to, home address, whatever. Right. Uh, your line items, you have item, you know, number one, number two, number three. So you have this way to link like, those. If you have a situation where your column family, you really don't have a way to qualify that, would that be a case not to use a column family? Yeah, absolutely. So again, so, in this case, I mean, the column family here is I've got data for what are you thinking of? I had that problem, and I'm just trying to. Yeah, no, no, right, right. So in this case, this is the works out well. Other examples, not so well. So in other words, I know some people will put their main data in one table, the metadata in a second table, the second column family. The only problem with that is that your metadata is usually much smaller than the, than the regular data, and that's going to kill you. Like if you're doing with a but if you're tagging photographs and you're putting them into a page base. Um, I forget what company's doing that, not Flickr. Um, sorry, I'm off camera. You but happy to. Okay. So is it Flickr? Some of these, one of these, a couple of these uh, websites were taking photographs, which are anywhere from 10 to 100K, very, very small, storing them inside an H base row, and they were storing the metadata in a separate column family. So what ends up happening is that your metadata is much smaller. It's probably a geotag, the ID, the user ID, the person put it up there, and some other data, a time the shot was taken. Very, very small relative to the image. So when that image row got split, you 
just put the metadata. They could have been separate tables. Even if they're column families, if you can, if you limit the overhead, it's okay. But it's not ideal. But to your point, yeah, it's it's hard to figure out when to do it, and that's the ship can tell you. We went through a project, and if, when in doubt, don't use them. So you're saying when in doubt, don't use them. But are you going to give it an example of when it's appropriate to use them? And what? Okay. This is this is the order entry. So like I said, your customer orders, your order entry system, your order entry is one column family. Your pick slips are going to be in a separate column family. Shipping slips are in another column family. And invoices are in another column family. So they all, they all tie back to the same order. So they'll have the same order ID, which your key can be a composite of customer ID, pipe, order ID. So each order is unique to the customer. Uh, if I want to look at it, since you're calling me, I can then say, here, here's all the orders you placed. I can then find the order you're talking about. So what's the reasoning behind breaking it up into separate column families? You because, said you have to have a good reason. Well, in this case, when, I, when I'm doing a pick slip, do I need to care about my invoices? Do I need to care about my shipping and all the other thing and, uh, order information? When, I, when I'm generating a pick slip, all that data is unique to the pick process. So I'm going to store it separately. So like, for example, if I have two warehouses or three warehouses, you're Amazon, you've got a warehouse in Indiana, you have a warehouse in California, you may, be, you may be ordering four or five books. They're coming from two different warehouses. Or you can order a product, you know, a book and you know, a CD, or a book and you know, a frying pan. So the goal is to reduce the amount of data sent over the pipe? Well, it's not just sort of the data. There's that, too, but it's also let's work with it. And that's actually a good point, too. Let's work with the data that we need to work with. So if all the data I need for a pick slip, I'm going to pull up the order information. I'm going to have that. I'm going to generate a pick slip based on warehouse. I'm going to store that pick slip separately so that when I go to the warehouse, all he has to do is grab that pick slip for that warehouse and say, I need to pull these items. He doesn't need that extra, extra information. Right. If you think about the fact that in each of these column families, you'll have n number of columns of data. If you say that for this column family, I want all of the data there. Over time, you have added more columns. Right. You just want it all. At that point, you can say, give me everything back from this column family for this record. There could be cases where you want to do batch processing on all the, maybe perhaps all the invoices for this customer, or across these different fields of uh, column families. You say, I've got this row, process all of the data from all of these column families. Right. So if you then say, I have an alternate approach, which is, uh, in this column family, I need this one column of data, you've now supported all three of those use cases with column families. Whereas just because you break up the data into column families doesn't necessarily buy you any support, like his example of images. You end up having great detriment to your system. I was just trying to understand what, what, the per, what the advantage you would, uh, why you wouldn't want to use this. It's, it's, why you want it's use really it. about the use cases and yeah. about how the APIs for HBase actually work and how you take advantage of those. Yeah, like, like I said, they, they can all be separate tables or they can be part of the same column family. The nice thing about being in the same column family, as, as Jim said, is that if I need to pull data from two of the column families or all of them, um, like for example, find all the orders that have back ordered uh, this product, I can do that. All the data, all the data from all those tables are going to be on the same uh, server, region server, so they're all going to be kept, kept in the same contiguous space. So it's much more efficient than saying, oh, your order entry is here, your invoice for that order is here, you have something on another region, another server. So when I pull the data back, I can pull it back much more, much in a much cleaner fashion. That goes back to the uh, to the whole API issue. And again, I apologize. There's really, you know, we, 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 I hopefully you have more time to go through the API and you can see this. <coughs> so as we said before, consider your column families with using sparingly. Focus on the data access pattern. The key is kind of very, very important because that's going to drive how fast you get your data out and how to avoid hot spotting and get better performance. And then there's always secondary indexing. And I know we really haven't talked about secondary indexing because I set up up front that HBase does not have native indexing built in, but we're going to show how it can be done. So you go back to our invoice, and this gets back to some of the other stuff we're talking about. We have you know, we have like a, uh, a company address, which is really a composite of fields, and it's really encapsulating a bunch of information. And as we can see here, it's not just that, but it's also your taxes, your phones, ship to address, all those have composite fields inside of them. 
the complex data types. So as we said before, everything in HBase is quite array, and that's not both good and bad. So it supports a lot of different types. So we can start thinking in terms of three dimensions. So if we just have a traditional relational database, we have a row and a column, that column is a set data type, it'll never change. So your column has to be an integer, it has to be a decimal, it has to be you know, a string of a certain size, it has to be a character array, it has to be a block. It'll never change. Inside HBase, it doesn't matter. And that's going to be dangerous too. So if I create a column foo inside my table, I can store whatever I want in that. There is no type checking. And that's probably something that's going to change over the years that uh, there's some talk about fixing. Uh, if you start looking at uh, Salesforce.com's uh, SQL type system on top of it, they do some type checking there. So really in HBase, we have the ability to do row column by structure. So it's 3D. We'll show that in a second. So if we take a look at it, again, divide arrays, everything's an object. I have strings, and I can separate the fields inside that string with pipes store that as a byte array. I can store uh, serialization, serialized Java objects or Kojic. So any objects that, that support serializable that is serializable, I can then store. And then there's Avro. So we talked about Java serialization, custom two string, two byte. So I, just, I create my string and I put a byte array. And then we also have Avro. Um, I really like Avro. Jim, I know you like Avro too. Uh, the community likes Avro, I'll show you in a second. Avro does make life easier. Uh, Avro was written by Doug Cutting, uh, who was also one of the co-authors of the do. Uh, it's language independent, so if you're working with Avro in, in general, it can be working with Java, C, C++, C Sharp, and other APIs. Uh, it's got the embedded schema with JSON. You have dynamic typing. I'm not going to read all this, but basically the idea. Who uses C sharp? Nobody. <laughs> All right, well, hang on a second. Anybody, anybody here from the .NET Microsoft era? Sorry. C blanking is for both and usable. Okay. So Boris has put up, spent a lot of time with that row. I really looked at it from, uh, in terms of Java, and the binding is, as you said, the binding is excellent. Uh, not just for this, um, on top of that, Avro, there's a company called Vdata. Uh, two of the founders came from Cloud, uh, Cloud Era, uh, which they've created uh, frameworks that sit on top of uh, HBase. Uh, they use Avro extensively. Um, if you're pulling in data from uh, web logs, it's going to be inside JSON format. So working with JSON, you want to use Avro uh, with HBase. Yeah. You're shaking your head, Boris. Move on. If, if, if you're dealing with JSON, cool chaos. Well, it just makes it easier getting in and out. Ignore him. Move on. Oh. Okay. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the idea is that, you know, again, Avro is there to make life easier. Um, we define Avro schemas. Uh, in the course, I have all the address type and everything else. Just to show you a simple record. Uh, it's well formatted. So this basically defines how that record is going to look like inside the Avro column. So to so the point I was trying to make earlier is that here we have a column, we'll call it address. I now store my address as a structure. I can then use Avro to pull the data out, put it into a Mojo, and I can work with it. So it makes life a lot easier to work with. And of course, if you're using pig and hitting HBase, it's the same thing too, you're using the alpha for survey. And surveys are serializer or deserializer. So if you work with Hive and Pig, you'll hear that expression quite a bit. And there is one for Pig for Avro. Sorry? There one exists for Pig for Avro. Yeah. Right. Well, like or higher. It's in it's in the uh, piggy bank. Yes. Or it was. Right. So have I confused everybody so far about adding complexity to their structure? Alright. Secondary indexing is kind of important too. Um, Native, again, native HBase has no index. As we talked about, normally your primary key has a backing store index in a relational database. Because of the way the data is stored, it's not technically an index, but it acts like an index. But if we want to use indexing, so let's say, for example, you 
our um, CCC information services, they process all the auto claims. So every claim has an auto ID information and some other information about it. But I want to say, all right, show me the average cost of fixing a mobile S80 from a front-end collision. I'm going to want to look only for accidents that occurred with mobile S80s. But I'm not going to make that my key. I'm going to make the insurance claim my key. So how do I get that information? I'm going to have to index that other information. And there are a couple ways of doing that. One is through an inverted table, which is probably the simplest thing to do. Then there's Lucene and Solar. Uh, some of you may have heard Cloudera announce uh, that they've integrated Solar Search into HDFS. That's uh, not really integrated to HBase yet. It's one way, it's still relatively new. Um, Matt Barr has done partnerships with a company that does solar support, so they offer solar into HDFS. Again, that into HBase. Um, there has been some research work into Lucene and HBase integration. There are other projects out there. Uh, but in terms of complexity, I would have to say inverted table is the easiest. Going to Lucene and solar uh, indexing, which if you're not familiar with them, they are in-memory indexes on uh, documents. So I can do complex searches and say, find me all the documents that have these words. And I'll be able to pull up the list of documents and match that. <coughs> so when we're working with indexing, um, first of all, it's important to remember, HBase writes are um, atomic, so that when I write a row, the row, the row is locked, the data gets written, and the data the lock is released. So when you hear the term row level locking, it has nothing to do with transaction processing, it has to do more or less with the atomic writes. So when I write to the base table, it's going to happen at one write, the write to the index is going to happen separately. So you can see where you have some consistency issues, potential problems. Uh, that causes, again, getting into this, the index is not always going to be matched. So if I have a problem where I wrote the base row and the system had a bug or a problem and the, the index data didn't occur, you can see we're out of synchronization. So there has to be mechanisms to do the synchronization. That's why we start looking at coprocessors. Coprocessors are little systems that sit back inside HBase on the server side that allow me to manage things behind the scenes, sort of like a stored procedure or a trigger, so that when I write to the base table, I can use a coprocessor to write to the index. <coughs> the only problem with that is, is that, is that coprocessors themselves are relatively new, they're not fully baked, and there are some problems, design, inherent design flaws in how the coprocessors are set up. And that's something that if you want to learn more about, we can take a look at, there's probably two or three HBase books already out there that deal with this top, that have chapters on these topics with coprocessors. The other problem too is that writing to your index is, is another, another cost you're actually writing to another table or you're writing to an in-memory solution. So when I write to the base table, I capture that trigger, I then have to write back to the index. When that index, when that's completed, I then go back to the base table and say, okay, you're free to go. So the other thing is everything we're talking about here is custom code. So if you want to implement indexes, it's all custom, it's not part of the system. So the quality of how it works is going to be on your shoulders. So if you can write good, clean, professional code, you're okay. If you can't, or you don't know enough about it to do, well, good luck. Again, your miles may vary in terms of performance. The old caveat. So again, what do we really come across? A road key is designed to support denormalization of data, not thinking in terms of um, normalized forms, relational forms, and support. Remembering that HBase is not relational. So this is the one thing that probably hurt us on a couple of initial early projects, and it's probably the hardest thing that I've seen on the mailing list user group talks, is that you've got to get away from thinking in terms of relationships. It's HBase, it's like a hierarchical system where when I pull a record, that's everything. And that's the important thing that, to make sure you understand that and, and, and think of those terms. Yeah. Is this the type of is not rational? Well, I'm not rational either, so. <laughs> yes, uh, it is. It's relational, but it isn't rational. Um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> See, this is a Freudian slip. So. <laughs>
Really? For me it is. It's relational instead of rational, sorry. Is that a Freudian slip? Okay. This is what happens when I don't drink too. Okay. You might help. Alright. Uh, we talked about Avro and also secondary indexing. And the key obviously takeaway is know your data. Other takeaways my pearls of wisdom. There's always more, there's more than one right answer. So take what I said with a grain of salt. These are things that I came across in multiple projects, and they've always worked for me. Um, they may, you may have a better solution, and it's important if you do, great. Like, for example, we talked about salting. The guy who came out salting came out and said, hey, this is the greatest thing. But then when you start comparing it to other people, you start taking a look at other options, you start to learn that's not the greatest thing. There are other, other better alternatives. Um, it's how you learn. Uh, the other thing, too, is kind of important. Um, we've gone out there and everyone says Facebook does something. Just because Facebook does something doesn't mean it's a good idea. And I can, I can go from first hand experience. Uh, they're solving a problem differently and they have a different environment. In Facebook, their goal is to solve the immediate problem and not think beyond, just steps beyond. So if you, if you do a design and your design, you can go like building a data warehouse. If you're building an enterprise data warehouse or doing a design, if you don't get it right the first time, you have no real easy way of backing it out. With Facebook, oh, we, have, we, we did a problem. Okay, I'll get another cluster. I'll just copy that. I'll just copy that to the new cluster the right way. Most places don't have that luxury. So that's why when we see when Facebook does something, take it with a grain of salt because it may not be the best way to do something. There are a lot of them. I can personally say I saw one system that worked great for their initial problem. But their next problem is they want to try to make it more real time. It would require a schema change. Most places don't have the ability to take 100 terabytes of data and convert it to a new schema. They do. Um, the other thing too is you know again I always talk about keeping it simple, following the rules. It takes a lot of experience to know when to break the rules and which rules you can break. So my advice is you start to learn the process. Walk before you jump and run. Because if you start to run and jump, you're going to trip, you're going to fall, and you're going to say, oh, this stuff's a piece of garbage. So your experience, I don't know if it's what I'm saying this, but you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're working with new technology that's relatively young. It's got maybe six years of experience behind it, whereas relational tables, uh, relational systems have 30 years. So in working with new technology, it's not always fully baked. It's open source, so there's going to be bugs in there, and they're going to get fixed. They're going to get enhanced. There's new features coming in. That code's going to break. If you stay within what you know to work and within the safety zone, you won't have any problems. And then as you get more of your system up and running, you're more familiar with it, then go out and break the rules. Does that make sense? The other thing, too, is, is good, clean code will always outperform um, bad designs. Uh, so even though we're looking at good clean schemas, the code that runs and access the data has to be clean and work well. We've seen systems, again, that if the code wasn't clean or wasn't performing, wasn't performing well, we would have problems. The system would not work. And if the system <coughs> has your expectations, your SLAs, you have to take a look not just at, at, the, at the schema, not just at the system, but also at the code. So always have as good clean code as you can and, and have that discipline. All right, so <coughs> the questions, obviously, Chicago Blackhawks, yay. Hey, do you want to give everybody 30 seconds on versions? Versions. Yeah, the number of versions for rows. Ah, sorry, thank you. <laughs> this is what happens when you write these slides in the last minute. Um, so we started talking about the cell column versions. So when you create a table, you can tell how many copies of the table you have. So because we have a write once, read many, if I create a row and I say, okay, I want this product color to be red, I insert the red, and it's going to have a timestamp inside the column. So we'll have pink colors, name of the column, we'll have red, and I'll have a timestamp. But now all of a sudden, somebody comes back and says, no, no, that's wrong. We want that to be blue. So what ends up happening is we then say, okay, we're going to insert blue. So because you don't have the ability to update, what you have is you create a new version of that cell, and you're going to store blue. It's going to have a timestamp. 
So with HBase, if I, if I use one API, I can select the last set of rows. So I say, here, get this row, give me all the last cell versions, all the latest timestamps. So I'll see blue. At the same time, there's another API that says, give me all the versions. By default, HBase gives you three versions. You can change that number to as many as you want. You can go and create, you know, more of the max number of NSAR. Uh, that number, of, I don't know, 64, you know, how, many, how many thousands you can do, or how many millions of versions. You can do that. It's not advisable. Two to the 32nd minus one. Thank you. <laughs> Two to the 32nd minus one. So you can create that number of versions. That's not really advisable. The idea of versions is not so much to keep track of, it's to keep track of some of the road changes if you have to roll back, because we don't have we don't have the idea of transaction processing. So we can change the value, and if we have to, we can pull it back from a later earlier version. If we delete, obviously, once you hit the delete or tombstone marker, that's all gone. But before then, you can actually get around that too, that's a tough one. But the whole idea is that I keep track of the versions inside HBase. So that's where you start seeing that. So you have sell that number of versions. Did I say that right? Does that make sense, Jim? Or did I answer? Yeah, the, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, takeaways for versions is if you really care to store multiple versions, you should do something like use reverse timestamping. Store your versions in separate rows, and if you ever need to scan them and see your history, get them back into multiple rows as opposed to letting HBase handle it for you. Because if you set the versions too high, you will kill HBase. There are documented cases where some companies try to say that, oh, our database stores multiple revisions better, but they don't tell you what the software is they're using. They literally could be using HBase, storing only one version, using one reverse timestamp. One will far outperform the other. Right. If you want, if you want to make temporal data part of your data, your data set, you can do that. So you can store your data based on time. So that instead of storing it in one cell, one column, you'd have a column based on uh, the information plus a timestamp. Hey, Mark, 10 gig. <laughs> Any more questions or anything? Yeah. Background on the. Uh, what's the driver for HBase as opposed to the database? Is it all because it's open source? Well, no. So, okay, so obviously Hadoop is not going to replace your relational database. 